Hi, my name is Marshall Shore, also known as the Hip Historian, or the Hip Historian. And I want to welcome you to this 1930s adobe mansion called the Eisendrath House. But our story actually starts a little bit earlier than that when there was a trend of wealthy Midwest socialites coming to Arizona to avoid the harsh Midwest winters and descending on Phoenix to enjoy our amazing winters. Probably one of the most prominent families would be the Wrigley family, famous for the Wrigley Mansion. Well, Rose Eisendrath was part of that set. She was the widow of a glove manufacturer. And so she came here for a girls weekend. She went to a local resort and was told, ma'am, I'm sorry, you can't stay here because you're Jewish. She then turned around, bought a plot of land here in Papago Park and built this adobe mansion. She called it Lomaki, which is Hopi for pleasant home. She lived here for about six years and passed away here in the house. Then comes along Gloria Gould Baker, the granddaughter of Jay Gould, one of the robber barons. She was a very fit and trim woman. And one morning she went out for a swim in the pool. After a slight rain, she slipped on the tile, hit her head and drowned in the pool. It's said that her spirit still hangs out here in the house. Now in the 80s, it became the epicenter of a lot of art. It became a gallery that showed a lot of artists that have gone on for bigger and better things. It was also a place where they filmed a bad 80s zombie movie called Bikers vs. the Undead. I recently was talking to a friend who had seen a Meat Puppets concert right here on the back patio. I'm happy to say that then the city of Tempe bought this house and turned it into what we have seen today. It's now called the Eisendrath Center for Water and Conservation. And you can come here and take a tour. You can attend a class here, or you can even hold an event here. You could even do your own wedding right here at the Eisendrath House. Evening, everyone. I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. So this is our 32nd episode. Who knew we would have been going on this long? And, you know, we're actually going to be going into the whole new year. So it's going to be a lot more fun as we move forward. So thank you all so much for being here. So my name is Marshall Shore. I want to welcome you all. Now, some of you are watching on Facebook, YouTube, and even Twitch on this day before Thanksgiving, where I hope you all are going to be safe, whatever you decide to do. I want to welcome you and let you know this is only made possible because of all of you out there watching. Um, and some of you have even donated to the cause. Um, my Venmo is on the very top of the screen. We also do have sponsorship from AARP. And they have a message looking for ways to stay active, healthy, and informed without leaving home. AARP Arizona has lots of online offerings and virtual get-togethers. Find out all the ways you can click to connect with your community at aarp.org slash near you. And you can find out about all the different events that they have going on virtually from boogie woogie to a drum circle to getting back to basics and even how to 
survive the holidays. So there's lots of good stuff going on right there. Now, what can you expect on this 30-second show? Well, we're going to have lots of fun. We've got our trivia coming up. We have Little Arizona. We have some show and tell, some history. And later on, I'm going to bring on my friend Leslie, who's going to talk about comedy history. So we're going to have lots of fun. And of course, it would not be a happy hour if it wasn't for a cocktail. So. If this is your first time here, you might be wondering, who is that man on my screen? Well, you know, I said my name is Marshall, but I also go by the hip historian. Now, about a little over 20 years ago, I was working in a library in Brooklyn, a beautiful Carnegie building, and realized it was time for a change. I had, have an, I had had enough of slush and snow and ready for something else. So I traded that library for a library that was in S Central City South, which was, which was Harmon Library, actually the first library, branch library built by Phoenix Public back in 1950. Um, it has been since demoed and a brand new fancy library has been built. But when I got there, there was this, this rich oral tradition of the community. And I quickly realized that that was not really going on for a lot of communities. So I just started sitting down, listening to people and hearing their stories and then going off and researching and telling more. And so it got to the point where a little over a decade ago, I actually walked away from libraries, making this my full-time gig, tracking down our history. Now to do that, we had to load everything into a big orange cube, a U-Haul. And you know, the International World Headquarters is right here in Phoenix. And when we got here, we moved into a lovely 1956 ranch. Now, when we first moved in, it was beige on beige on beige. I'm happy to say now it is a lovely two-tone of seafoam and cantaloupe. And there is pretty much what my kitchen looks like today. I mean, if you take a look, all that buttercream yellow tile. Now, something that might be interesting is the fact that my push buttons for the stovetop are actually inset in the wall, as opposed to being on the front of the stove, as well as then my in-the-wall oven that matches that tile has no window. So in case you want to bake something, you've got to oh so carefully check on it by slowly opening that door. But if you let that door slam, if you're baking a cake, you know what happens to that cake? It just deflates. And nobody likes a flat cake. Now, when I first got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history here, but I knew that wasn't true because every time I went for an adventure, either on foot, on bike, or in a car, I came faced with so many amazing stories, people, places. And then there's that post-war boom that I think in a lot of ways made the Arizona that we all know and love today. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed you on the way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers. And in some cases, looking for a house just like mine. And then there's this man, Dr. Carrier, the inventor of air conditioning, who is the man who basically changed how we interact with our environment. And so many of us would not be here nearly as happy as we are now. So you might wonder, how does one get a name like the hip historian? Well. You know, back in 2012, on February 14th, we had been celebrating Statehood Day across the state. But on February 14th, which is Statehood Day, they did a great event at the state capitol with a huge stage and all kinds of other things going on. And someone gave me 15 minutes on that main stage. And so they were actually trying to, some of you may have heard of Marshall Trimble, who is the official state historian. And someone was getting me confused. And 
they said, oh, he's the hip historian. So, of course, I stole that and have been running. Now, for that event, I actually talked about one of my most favorite events in Arizona's past called Mask of Yellow Moon that ran from 1926 to 1955. At its height, it had about 5,000 high school and college students performing. It was touted right up there with Mardi Gras as something that everyone in the country should go and see. And I was lucky enough to find three dresses that had been designed by students and made by a home economics class and was able to convince three lovely friends to put on those dresses. And so they paraded around the stage as we talked about Mask of the Yellow Moon. Now, that's a lot of what I do are lectures and tours. And you can imagine in this time of COVID, that doesn't really happen right now. And so... I started this as a way to share stories and have people share stories with me because I realized most of my best material actually comes from people. And so this way I actually get a chance to talk about a wide variety of things. Now we have started doing a walking tour of kind of haunted history in downtown Phoenix. Our next one will be on Saturday, December 12th. That is five to seven. Now we, everybody is wearing a mask and Deb and I both wear microphones under our masks so that way everyone can hear us. Now, if you would like to reach out to me, you'll notice for those of you on Facebook, there is a chat session off to the right. There is also, you can reach out to me on Facebook, Marshall Shore Hip Historian. You can follow me on Instagram as well, Hip Historian, or good old fashioned email works as well. And that is hello at hiphistorian.com. Or you can check out my website, which is hiphistorian.com as well. Now, I will ask if you're watching on Facebook, if you would be so kind to click on that little button underneath that says share. And so that way your friends will see all the fun that we're having with Arizona history. And because it is a happy hour, I am happy to say that the Hotel Valley Ho at, with Cafe Zuzu, their bartender, PJ, actually has been creating cocktails. And so tonight we are doing the Harlequin, which is a variation of a French 75. And... Let's see. Oh, there we go. And so, and, and PJ knows how I love to act like a real bartender and make amazing cocktails. So he makes these little kits for me that you can also go to the Valley Ho and pick up as well. And so this has all of our ingredients, our Aperol, our gin. And then with this, he even included a lovely little can of champagne. <laughs> it feels kind of funny saying a can of champagne. So let's pour. And of course, I don't have a champagne glass. So shh, I'm using a beer glass. Don't tell PJ. All right, so there we have our Harlequin cocktail. It's so light and refreshing. It's actually something we're going to serve this summer. But, you know, as PJ put it earlier, summer didn't really happen. So they're hoping to be able to serve that poolside next year. So it's got a little bit of lemon juice, honey, and of course, champagne. Now it's time for show and tell, which I like doing because, you know, I have a house full of stuff. And so since we're talking about comedy history, nope. Oh, so here we have a VHS tape. Now, somewhere in the house, I actually have a way to play this. 
but I don't know where it is at the moment. But this was a tribute done by Channel 5 for Walson and Ladmo. Now, originally it started off as the It's Wallace and then became Wallace and Company. And it was on the air for 35 years. Oops, nobody wants to see the bartender. And it was one of those shows. It was at, it's actually the longest running kids program on the globe. It was famous for so many things. One of them was the Ladmo bag, which was created. Initially, they were giving out prizes and they had kids pick from all these toys. And that was taking far too long. So they decided that they would make a bag. So that way they could just hand the bag off to the kid. And they were done as so having to sit there and wait till they made a choice of a toy. So, and they were also, they filmed at channel five studios. It was always done live in the morning. And if you're driving downtown, down central, you will see the old channel five studio with a big mural on the side of the building of Wallace and Ladmo and Gerald, probably one of the most famous characters off of that. Now, through the miracle of modern technology, oh my gosh, have we got a treat for you. Hello, Leslie. Hey. <laughs> Hi, Marshall. How are you tonight? I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. It's, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me on. Oh, my Hi. pleasure. My friend, so, the historian. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I do. Uh, I've been doing comedy for uh, since about oh, 2011 here in town. A little bit of theater, some of the uh, productions at Space 55. Uh, Dwayne Daniels, he was one of my teachers. Uh, I, I enjoyed acting, but I'm, you know, sometimes you just got to call it and be like, you are terrible at acting. So uh, I did some Space 55 stuff, which I love, which I love. And they were always so kind. Um, uh, if I can do it like a tiny plug, I'm going to hopefully I think I'm going to be one of the hosts for Bloody Mary Xmas. They're going to be doing that online. So ah. I'll, be, I'll be one of the bartender hosts or somehow in between making drinks. BJ wanted me to do that anyway. So hopefully I'll do that. That's next week. Ah, and, uh, okay. and then, oh, also, I guess stir crazy. I'm on one of their days. They give back to a charity. They've got a charity that they do three days of comedy and um, all local comics, and they give all the money to uh, a charity like Jerry's Kids or something like that. So I guess check out Stir Crazy, too. That's a really nice. Uh, they made a ton of money last year. Tom Sims, the owner, told me that they made a ton of money last year for the kids or the charity. So yeah. anyway, Stir Crazy and uh, Space 55. Such a great space. I mean, they do all kinds of fun things at Space 55. They do. They really, uh, yeah. And they've got that new spot too. It's a much tinier. It's like the black box theater that, you know, it could afford to be. Now, how are you, how are you, how are you enjoying your Harlequin? I think this is actually the first time that the guest has had the same cocktail. Mm. So it was nice. Thank you for dropping it by my door. Oh, you're welcome. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was great. Mm. Not a lot of people intentionally feed me alcohol, so thank you. That's very brave of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's not high octane, so <laughs> it's not it's not really. Yeah, the uh, this is adorable. The champagne. I it's know. There. I mean, that's what I thought. I was like a little can of champagne that sounds so like white trash decadent. <laughs> born in Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> were you born? Were you born in Arizona? No, I actually, I was born in Indiana. That's right. Okay. Uh, I, I was halfway listening to your <laughs> opener. I'm sorry. Well, I'm I didn't even talk about where I actually came from. So yeah, so I grew up in Indiana, a little tiny farm town. And so pretty much then moved my, got myself to New York City. So. Go, go east, young man. Indeed. And then it was like, oh, now it's time to move. So where do you go? Hello, Phoenix. <laughs> 
What'd you do? Just throw a dart at the at the map and no, so actually, so I actually wound up here. So I've been here 20 years. My parents have been upstate Arizona for about 25, 26 years in the middle of nowhere. What does that mean, upstate? Is that Flagstaff? Um, um, they're in a little town called Yucca. Oh wow! Uh, so basically, like if you threw if you throw a dart between Kingman and Lake Havasu, you would hit my parents. Okay. I mean, it's a town of like 250 people, so it's a little bit larger than the town I grew up in, but still. Who do you look most like? Your mom or your dad? My, my mom, definitely oh. my mom. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, it's funny. It's like on my driver's license, I really do look at my mom. I'm like, oh my God, if she, well, I guess if she had a beard, but. <laughs> she should just let her underarm hair grow out. And then, <laughs> and then comb it over. She should just go with, mm. yes, well. <laughs> Your parents sound lovely. I'm very happy for you. So. How much All right. do we have? Like an hour? Is that what we have? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is stronger than I thought it was going to be. Hey, uh, what was this? Was this fruit juice or was this booze too? That's booze as well. There's a little bit of gin in there. Oh, oh criminy. I just thought it was some juice. All so, right. So yeah, no, no, there's some gin and some Aperol, a little bitters. Oh, I like how you're using all three things. It's like you've got your cup, the can of champagne. I do. You know what? It's inevitable. Wherever I go out to eat, I, I end up having three drinks of something in front of me, whether it's water, coffee, and whatever, it, there's always three glasses. I don't know. I think it's, a, is that a thing? That's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. Is that an autism thing? I feel like that's a spectrum thing, but you know what? The spectrum is pretty much opened up pretty wide. To you know, I think it's, isn't everybody on the spectrum at some level? Right. So we all have our moments. Yes, we do. <laughs> Andy Warhol would say we had 15 of them. Um, it, indeed, 15 minutes of fame. Luckily, we're not famous yet. So our 15 minutes hasn't started yet. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sort of all, I feel like mine's just sort of all piled up. Like, you know how you just sweep shit out from underneath your stove? It's like, oh, my little pile of dirty fame right there. <laughs> All right, so, so let's talk a little bit about Jill Kimmel. Uh, yeah, let's talk about Jill Kimmel. I, man, you know, you know how you know how when you you somebody's always in your satellite, but you never really get to know them or get to know them better or like them better until it's they're about to leave. <laughs> uh, so you know what can I say about Jill? She thinks I'm funny, so I like her. Uh, <laughs> and I think she's funny, so, uh, you know, she likes me, hopefully. Um, but she's just a she's just a gem. And uh, I said that I've got I've got this thing I'm doing. And can I just talk to you about your experience in um, in doing comedy in Arizona? Because she's been here since she was 15. And I have that little interview with her. Uh, she's been here since she was 15. And as you can tell by her last name, her her brother is Jimmy, the uh, uber popular uh, uh, late night talk show host guy. But uh, she's really her own person. Now, I uh, know that she is. Um, so she moved here when she was 15 with her parents, uh, born in New York, moved to Vegas and then moved here when she was 15, went to Corona del Sol um, high school. Ah, and didn't really want to do comedy. I was asking her, I'm like, what was, you know, what was your big impetus? Were you ever like, and she's like, no, you know, I was 15 to 20. I just wanted to meet boys and, you know, hang out and have fun and, you know, go out with my friends to the mall or the, you know, surf city or whatever. And then, uh, and then she talks a little bit about how uh, she kind of got this gig at Dos Gringos. Which okay, is, should we play that interview? We might as well. Let's okay. play it. It's pretty heavily edited, but you no, know, born in New York, raised in Las Vegas, and then right. moved here when I was 15. When I started doing comedy, I was doing it for less than a year, I think, and I was at the improv, and some couple came up to me and said, Hey, we have a restaurant it's called Bongo's, it's in Chandler, which is you know close to where I was living. And we'd love if maybe you could do an open mic like once a week at our place, you know, maybe help bring in a little business. So I was like, 
yeah, sure. I knew nothing about it. I brought Brian Ritchie with me to come with me and like help me. I didn't know what I should like ask for. I had no idea. And he'd been doing it for a while. So he helped me like whatever, talk to them. And we set up and we started doing, we did it for a few years and then they closed down because the other set of owners got a divorce. So they lost the liquor license. So that place closed. And then one of the, the husband in the group, Doug, he went over and took over Joe Gringos. He was like the GM. So he's like, let's do the show here. So we did the show at Joe's Bongos. It was like two and a half, three years. And the show at Joe's Gringos ran for nine years. We wrapped it up last summer. Yep. Yep. I did it a few times. Like for nine years. And like the last two and a half years, I was gone quite a bit. So I'd always have like a guest host or whatever, because I was just traveling a lot working. I mean, that show was really because I was getting paid a hundred bucks a week and free Mexican food. Um, it was a good way for me to stay in touch with the local scene. So I got right. to know some of the comedians and stuff um, that maybe I wouldn't have otherwise known because if I was traveling or, you know, when you're working at the clubs, like the improv and stuff, you don't always get to do like open mics. And it was kind of something that kind of, kind of kept me honest in a way where it was like, I always had some little like local, like something tangible to hold on to that I could go, I'll go Tuesday night. And like, I was still in the open mic scene, even if I wasn't actually like doing open mics. So I think that was good for me, but it definitely didn't like shape any comedy. Like I would just sit there on my phone the whole time, just like struggling to get through the comics, you know, cause open mics is where you test out new jokes or you're super new yourself and you're not funny yet. Or, and I gotta say that room was horrible. If anyone got two laughs in a seven minute set in that room, you're probably a comedic genius. <laughs> that room was really, really tough. Sometimes I would see people there and then someone would book them somewhere else and I'd be like, <laughs> them? and they're like, why? I'm like, they're terrible. And then I would see them, I go, they're good. It was, it was Dos Gringos. It was just that place that it sucked. And like, yeah, but it was fun. And they were good people and they were very good to me. And I really, really missed the chips. And they had this white, like jalapeno cream cheese dip. They did. But I never blocked anyone from there. Even if I wasn't like on great terms with you, like if you wanted to come, you could come. And it was a fun place. I enjoyed it. It definitely developed me as like someone who understands what people who put shows together go through. Stand up, it's like, let's have a bullshit session. And you just get on the stage. And I mean, some people don't. Some people are very, you know, like scripted and thought out. Not me. I'm like, what's going to happen tonight? I don't know. Just, I love the comedy scene here. I love the clubs, all of them, you know, everything from Stir Crazy to House of Comedy, Stand Up Live, CB Live, Tempe Improv, of course. You know, all of the clubs I love and I'm in with all the people and I am able to perform at every one of them, which is so nice and kind of rare. And Jonathan's running Crank Yankers. I'm actually doing production work for Crank Yankers right now. And so I wouldn't have to do a show where I have restrictions, like a cruise ship or something where they're like no pursing and that kind of thing. It's a little more stressful because you're like, now nah, I got to follow some rules. And I don't, I like to be able to just do whatever I feel like doing on stage that the audience is liking. I like to be able to go, oh, they like this. Let me give them more of this. So, you know, I love that. And if you're like restricted, stressful. I would be Princess Chippy. I'd be like, <laughs> you sons of bitches, this tiara does not fit on my goddamn head. Can somebody please light this cigarette for me? <laughs> that, la that last one I, I had asked her, I said, if you could be any princess, what would it be? And she was like, what? And I said, uh, give me a Brooklyn princess. So that's what that was. But there's a ah. lot of information in everything she just said. So, um, yeah, like she she rattled she rattled off all the the top the top uh, comedy club rooms, comedy rooms. Uh, how she started ran that ran that weekly, and she, she we were talking about it, and it was a brutal room. She was she's right. Yeah, if somebody did get a couple of laughs they knew what they were doing or they had extreme or they had old material. They weren't working on anything new, you know, and like some comics will do that. They're like, if nothing goes right, they'll be like, Oh, I'm just working on new stuff right now. And it's like, yeah, right. Whatever. But, uh, but that was great. We talked, she and I talked, we talked for like, I don't know, like 40 minutes and 
Wow. She's just, she's, just, she's, she's a live wire. She's got a, she's got a lot of fire, a lot of irons in the fire and uh, she's opinionated and she's funny. I like her. I like her. And I think that she's been, you know, like, I did not know that the Kimmel clan was in Arizona from like her, like, like, or, or, like late eighties on word, you know, until the, the boys all ended up going to LA and, you know, Jimmy got with the radio program and the man show and all that stuff. But, but you know, it's a shape it, and she's a powerful female. I, you know, I can't, I can't deny that that's needed in Arizona. And, and I try not to be biased because I have a lot of male friends that are comics, but I gravitate towards the female comics, or, you know, Right. I guess I guess it's biological, you know, again, but I can certainly like like the other like the modest proposal guys we have coming up, the Ron Babcock and Ryan McGee. I talked to them for a little bit about their experience doing comedy in Arizona in the mid 90s, uh, like having a, a magazine that they were trying to put out, as well as doing a weekly show in Tempe on Mill Avenue. And then they were doing a monthly at Paper Heart Gallery straight downtown. So. You know, there's that, there's that balance, and well, she was just great to talk to, and uh, um, yeah, she's great. And also, if anybody uh, gets one of the questions right for trivia, I do have a signed Jill Kimmel hat. Wow! Uh, a fancy Jimmy Kimmel bag, came in. but the hat is the hat's pretty rad. It says Jill right there. I asked her to sign it. Cause I'm a nerd, nah. <laughs> but that's a decent giveaway. It's yeah. Cool. And I'll tell you the other later. Anyway. So I really enjoyed talking to her. She's a sweetheart, but she's got, she's leaving now because her entire family lives in California. Now her parents have eventually moved out there. You know, obviously her brothers lives out there with his family. And then she's got another brother. Uh, she is the only girl, which I asked her, you know, I said, you know, do you, would you want a sister? She's like, no, I don't like to share. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but anyway, but so she's got to leave now. She's like, it's just me and my dog. And like, my kids are going to college in California. My family's there. So it's time for her to move right? and you know, be around her family. So you can't, you can't hold Arizona comedy on your shoulders forever. Right. No, I mean, well, and she's part of that now comedy history of Arizona. She is. She is. I think so. Yeah. Part of my history. You know, right. and I, she, yeah. And I was, like I said, I was doing Dos Gringos. The first time I went to Dos Gringos, I was shaking in my boots because, you know, her name, Jill Kimmel, because I did, you know, I started doing comedy late. I didn't have all the, like the, the stuff in my brain. I was just like, I'll tell jokes somewhere and that'll be great. And then, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it's hard when you're up there sweating and, you know, there's like someone who can, May, not make or break you, but you know, I'm not going to take a shit on her stage <laughs> and have her say, get, Oh, Leslie Martin. She sucks. She took right. a poop on my stage. <laughs> I don't know. All right. So let's talk about Ryan and Ron. Yes. Let's talk about them as well. They, uh, they, um, again, mid nineties. I, uh, when I was booking that Kimber's Mo club modified, I worked there from 2001 to 2005 and I had them on a couple of shows because they were doing the modest proposal and comedy stuff. So uh, we were talking last night and um, I had them open for Eugene Merman. Uh, they brought Todd Berry to Modified and he did a, a, a show there. Um, they were doing just all sorts of crazy, just weird stuff that was maybe ahead of its time for Phoenix, you know. But um, anyway, yeah, let's let's listen to the. All right. Let's listen to that. And really, Ron and I started the comedy magazine. Just we wanted to perform, but I, we we, it was weren't. easier to start a comedy magazine about stand-up comedy than to actually go do stand-up comedy. Yeah, we were so we were both scared to perform, but when we finally did uh, get our get to get our our will uh, together and our, um, our confidence, and we're like, all right, well, where do we go? to open mics and we found like a couple of musician open mics at coffee houses which was really weird where we we showed up with instruments that we didn't know how to play and just told jokes and banged the instruments because we wanted to fit in we're like well we got to go show up with instruments you know we don't want to 
be and weird. Like doing that first coffee house open mic. Um, somebody uh, like invited us to go do a hip hop open mic because they thought we were weird and that people would like it. And half of that was true. And half of that was true. I mean, people did think we were very weird and came up to us afterward and told us that, but respected the, the gall we had to get on stage at a, yes. a hip hop open mic. One of those reverse compliments of, wow, I can't believe you guys did that. You know, that kind of thing. We were like, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, and then we started finding a couple of open mics, but they were very, like comedy open mics, but they were very sporadic and you didn't know when they were going to get canceled and whoever was running them wasn't, you know, very reliable. And so we just started our own open mic at, on Mill Avenue, which was the Rio Salado Brewing Company at the time. It was... Because at the time, everybody was taking a comedy class at the Tempe Improv. And we like, we just didn't have the money to do that. And Ryan was very anti-comedy class. I wanted to take the class because I'm like, you know, a little Roman Catholic boy who, you know, respects authority. And Ryan was like this punk rock kid, like, we're not taking no class, man. And so we would do the open mic on our own. But it was great because it gave a place people to go to every Sunday, rather than just having this one class show once every three months or whatever. And the monthly show we did at the Paper Heart was actually this thing that like was getting a lot of people to come and we'd get like little write-ups in the paper. We got, we won like one of the Phoenix New Times Best Of Awards one year. And that's where Ryan and I would really pour our heart and soul into. And we would do like all new sketch, stand-up and videos. And I think the magazine for us was, it became really in the beginning, basically our questions were like, so how did you get started in comedy, you know? And then it, it kind of dovetailed into just having access to our favorite performers. We had a magazine and a weekly open mic gave us a little bit of legitimacy, uh, legitimacy. and so guys um, who were taking like the Tempe Improv class started coming out and doing our shows. And who else did like, you get in there? Josh, it was Josh McDermott, you know, That's who's right. gone on on to be the uh, Walking Dead. Um, like Chris, Chris, Chris Bennett, Bennett would do it, Skalniak, Hibbler, Jared Blake, Dan Goff. Um, Cass McPherson. You know, yeah, and then we would- Danny Arnaz. But we wouldn't have many people on the show. We would like really, tr basically it was a showcase for Ryan and I and like videos and sketches that we did. And we, like all the other shows would be like 10, 15 comics, just these never ending marathons. And so we would always have like two local comics at the most. So it was like this thing that was like, we, we try to make it this thing that like it was this special occurrence thing. And we wanted people to do like their best stuff rather than it just be just another show. Because we actually worked really hard on getting an audience there, and you know you could burn through an audience so quickly if you just keep them, keep them hostage. Was there just like a beautiful simplicity to all of this that like it's so it was so naive and so just real and like a purity to it? Uh, we you know what we opened for our first ever gig was opening for Patton Oswalt, and I remember we were driving around with him, and, he, and I I think we asked him like, hey, do you have any like advice and he just was like just he's, i remember and it was something that we really took to heart he said for the first five years he says it doesn't fucking matter he's like you have no idea how much it doesn't fucking matter like just do anything try everything he's like it, it like i'm telling you it does not matter and that was a very freeing thing for me to hear because i was like all right well he knows what he's doing and, but then he said, after five years, he said, just focus on one thing. Like, he's like, try everything for the first five years, then focus on one thing. And I, I never did that part. I never focused. <laughs> Neither <laughs> but, of us ever really focused, but we, we took the first piece of advice very strongly. <laughs> like, literally, the Jill Kimmel thing, and the, those guys, Ryan McGee and Ron Babcock, Two very similar stories, but I feel like that if you listen, that's what the comedy scene is. You know, people support, like, you know, you heard they're throwing out names. Jill's throwing out club names. Those guys are throwing out names of comics, some of which are still doing stuff. Cass McPherson came back from L.A. and she's back in Scottsdale running a mic, you know. So I feel like that's the thing about comedy here. It's so, so damn supportive. You can not like someone, but if they've got good comedy, then you are compelled to at least respect their comedy. Unless they're, you know, unless they're 
complete assholes and their comedy sucks, then, you know, get out. Right. Now, I know, you, you, now I know you've also been doing comedy in your own backyard. It's true. We have um, me and my uh, hetero life mate, Christopher Royer, are running a live on Brill because that's the street I live on uh, in our backyard. I say our, he's lived here for two years. So I think he can have part of the backyard anyway. So yeah, Friday, it's always the, the fourth Friday of the month. Yes. It's always the fourth Friday mm -hmm. of the month. Um, Cause it's coming up this Friday. So uh, now also is, can people watch it virtually? You can watch it. It's a free show. It's limited seating here, but again, it's weird pandemic. So we're being really careful, but we love it when people watch online and um, it's fun. We've got the, the sound really, the sound is working great. We've got like lighting. We've got some great comics tomorrow. We've got James or sorry, this Friday, we've got James Hollenscheid headlining um, and a couple of good drop-ins. Uh, Carrie Carson, Stina Salito, uh, Ryan Stalder, uh, uh, Kristen Davis, and then, uh, and again, Hohenscheidt is uh, headlining, but we may or may not have a, a quick drop in from Michael Longfellow from, uh, he's from uh, Phoenix, but he's also been busy out in California. Cause you know, when you're a young comic with nothing to lose, you want to get your bearings here for a little bit and then fucking split for one of the coasts. Right. That just seems how it goes. All right, so are you ready for some trivia? Yes, I think I forgot all my questions. Gosh, I hope I win the hat. <laughs> <laughs> so I was explain trivia. So what we'll do is we'll go through all, all the trivia we have is multiple choice. And then we'll take a little bit of a music break. And then, we'll go on, then, then we will launch into talking about the answers and telling the stories behind some of those answers. Oh, so it's oh. not just how much you know when you walk in, but how much you know when you walk out. That's great. So. And if anybody was listening carefully, there may have been some answers in those first. I few. know. I heard. Yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh. So. <laughs> Maybe no one's watching, but that's okay. If anyone's watching, say hi. All right. So Phoenix and Flagstaff have comedy festivals that have gained popularity. Name them. So that means it's going to be two out of these four. All right. So A, Bird City, Bird City Comedy Fest. B, Copper City Comedy Fest. C, UFO Comedy Fest. Or D, Big Pine Comedy Fest. So yeah, so part of the fun is coming up with the wrong answers. I like UFO Comedy Fest. <laughs> do you need right. to tell you that? Do should I say the names when? Nope, nope. We'll go through those later on. Good, good. Okay, okay. Yep, so we're, gonna, we're just going to run through all the questions, the questions now. folks. Uh, <clears throat> so people can either keep track of you can either keep track of them in the chat. You know, it's like I've also had someone send me. They did a um. One week I said, oh, you know, if you have a magic marker on a leg, you can keep track of your answers there. And they sent me a photo of them keeping track of their answers on their leg. So whatever makes it easy for you, you go right ahead and do that. Was that a grinder thing or Tinder? I don't <laughs> No, No, it was just somebody. No, just no, neither. It was a history thing. All right. Which stand-up comedian wrote about his battle with non-Hodgkin's Lova called Cancer on $5 a Day and ultimately met his demise in Scottsdale? A, Robert Blue, B, Quentin Crisp, C, Robert Schimmel, or D, Trey Green? One of those guys wrote a book about called Cancer on $5 a Day. And that's the reason why the multiple choice. So even if you don't know the answer, you have a good shot of getting it right because it's at least one of those. <laughs> one in four. Right, one in four. There's a 24% chance you're going to be right just by throwing a dart. All right. Name the Phoenix comic who was head writer for Joan Rivers' Fashion Police on E. Was it A, Edgar Soto, B, Kevin Michaels, 
C, Tony Tripoli, or D, Tad Conaway. One of those guys became the head writer for Joan Rivers' Fashion Police. Which internationally famous Bisbee comic wrote Diggin' Up Mother, a love story? Was it A, Douglas Fairbanks? B, Doug Stanhope? C, Mikey Lipkowitz? Or D, Leslie, don't you be laughing. D, Leslie Jordan. Mikey Lipkowitz owes me money, by the way. <laughs> you know, I hear he's a bum. He is, he's a dumb bum, get out. All right, question five. We're at that halfway mark. All mm -hmm. right, what comedian was an Arizona State Teachers College alum and co-creator of The Tonight Show and its very first host? A, Steve Allen, B, Bob Hope, C, Phil Santos, or D, Chuck Wagon? <laughs> One of those folks was co-creator of The Tonight Show. Who was it? <laughs> All right, question six. Which Arizona comedy club is part of the national franchise founded by Bud Friedman? A, Bill, Brill Street Comedy. B, Copper Blues. C, Laugh Factory. Or D, Tempe Improv. Which one of those is part of the Bud Freeman? franchise Watsoro High alum was on Roseanne as well as on David Letterman 28 times A. Sarah Silverman B. Sandra Bernhard C. Nancy Sinatra or D. Pearl Cho all right coming into the home stretch Question eight, Arizona Bay, a comedy album referenced what iconic comedian's hatred of L.A.? A, Bill Hicks, B, Toby Tang, C, Ernesto Ortiz, or D, Gene Moore? Which one of those hates L.A. so much that they did a comedy album called Arizona Bay? All right, question nine. What sarcastic comedian landed a writing gig on SNL in 1990? A, David Diamond. B, Pearl Hart. C, David Spade. Or D, Chauncey Black. I know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I thought it would be a little too much. Chauncey. <laughs> so. This is so good. To put one of every suit. I did I didn't want to quite follow <laughs> it. <the same pattern. laughs> so all right. The last one. all right. What Greenway High School alum was a favorite on Tim and Willie's radio program for calling in as different characters, a semi-finalist on Last Comic Standing, and cast on Walking Dead. A, Seth Gilliam, B, Josh McDermott, C, Tom Payne, or D, Lenny James. One of those folks was on Tim and Willie's radio program, as well as on Walking Dead. And then we do have a bonus question. What Phoenix comic is billed as the birth mother of the sexual revolution by the Library of Congress? A, Sandra Bernhard, B, Genevieve Rice, C, Rusty Warren, or D, Rusty Knockers. So one of those folks is billed as the birth mother of the sexual revolution. All right, while you're all gathering your answers up, We'll do answers just ahead, but first we're going to take and talk a little bit about some music. And, you know, since we started off talking about Wallace and Ladmo, as well as my backdrop. Oh, you can't even see my backdrop. I can. Okay. All right. Here, I actually, I'll make it big so that way people can. 
Where in Phoenix is are those statues? So it is, they're at the zoo. Wow, I hate the zoo, but okay. Well, but they have good statues at the zoo. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. So you go for a variety of things. Mm -hmm. All right. So I figured if we're talking Arizona music, we should talk about Hug Cap and the Wheels. Wow. So Mike Candelo. Oh my God. So Mike Candelo was born here in Phoenix in 46. And in 63, he was hired by the Walsh and Ladmo show. And then he formed a group called Hubcap and the Wheels. And so Pat McMahon was the lead. They started doing, it was kind of a garage rock that was very much a parody of the Beatles and Elvis Presley. <laughs> they became so famous. They were shuttling between Phoenix doing Walsh and Ladmo and then would go sh do shows in LA. Oh, and they actually got really well known because they actually were able to outsell the Beatles records here in town. So at the last minute, they actually had a record deal. But Pat McMahon decided not to sign on that because it would have meant the end of Walsh and Ladmo because he would have then had to move to L.A. for the band. So, I mean, some of their famous songs were Work, Work. Or let's really hear it for Hubcap. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And so, I mean, every once in a while, you'll still stumble across the album. Um, Back of Man is still around town. Doing all kinds of fun things still. All right. So, answers dead ahead. Question. Can I ask you a quick question about Hubcap? Sure. Um, Did the rest of the band go on with... Going to LA and left McMahon, Pat McMahon here? Or did um, they... No, I actually, I don't know what happened to the rest of them, but it was like he was the front man and so mm -hmm. decided not to, I mean, because it was actually, I think, just created for fun and then became so famous that he was like, you know, let me stick to my hometown and... Wow. I wonder how the rest of the other, the bandmates felt about that. That's interesting. Yeah. Because he had all those characters he was doing for Wallace and Ladbo. Oh, he did a ton of characters. Yeah. And this was, I mean, this was yet another character. I mean, it's a bad wig with stick on eyebrows. Yeah. So. Yeah. It reminds me of my, uh, my uh, best friend, Dave Camp. He was in a band called the Biscaynes in uh, early on Phoenix, like the 90s. But um, the, Pat McMahon is dressed very, like the eyebrows. It really reminds me of Dave. It's funny. Anyway. All right. So question one, Phoenix and Flasif have comedy festivals that have gained popularity and it was A and D. Oh my gosh. Wait a minute. Let, let's make that big so people can see what you got in your hand. I've got a bird city. Whoever, whoever wins, whoever gets the right answers. I've got a bird city swag bag. Genevieve Rice, the founder and creator of bird city was nice enough to, to give me, it was, it's got a t-shirt. Uh, 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 hold on. It's got a t-shirt. Oh, this cool enamel pin that says Bird City. Oh, very cool. And the, the rubber ducky and the t-shirt and this water jug. And of course the tote. And then well, there's something. Yeah. Oh, she gave candy. Candy. Ah, very good. But anyway, there's some great stuff in here as well. So whoever gets that, gets that. Nice. It's been sitting back here the whole time, so I don't know if anybody saw it. <laughs> and gave away the answer. Uh -huh. But Big Pine, yeah, Big Pine run by Hillary Hudson, created by uh, Hillary Hudson. or She took it over from Ryan Stalder a couple of years after uh, he started it, but um, she's been running it. You know, she took it and ran, and it's been uh, four more years, I believe, that they've been doing that. And, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, Big Pine just did their uh, – their big comedy festival, but completely online, uh, which great, you know, more power to them. And I, it, I understand it, it came off really well, you know, anything new, some people are afraid to try, but I heard it, I heard it went off well and I'm, I'm very happy for them. And then of course, Genevieve has been running bird city for five, at least five, six years. Yeah. It's hard, man. It's hard to run a, it's hard to run a festival. All right. 
which stand-up comedian wrote about his battle with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma called Cancer on $5 a Day and met his demise in Scottsdale? Yep. C. Robert Schemmel. I believe um, what happened. So, yeah, he uh, he's, he became sort of a comics comic, Robert Schimmel did, and um, very funny, very popular. And so he had uh, he ended up getting cancer. It was sad. He, a son, his son died of cancer. Uh, Robert Schimmel mm -hmm. lost a testicle to cancer. And then um, he ended up being in a car accident, and that's what killed him. <laughs> In Scottsdale. Wow, he survived cancer only to be I fucking cancer if only just to be fucking killed by a car, basically. Wow. It's a death story. His daughter was driving the car and she it flipped somehow and the injuries that he sustained killed him. But yeah, right? He, Damn. And his, everybody else in the car was fine, but he died from his, you know, injuries. Wow. <laughs> That's awful. It <laughs> is awful. It's terrible. But I, I wonder if he would think that was funny because he was really an ironic comic. Anyway, go on. <laughs> All right. So the Phoenix comic who was head writer for Joan Rivers was Tony Tripoli. Someone right. guessed it was Tony earlier and they would have indeed been right. And, you know, actually, we and we have a video of Tony talking about an experience with Joan. We do. Really quickly, the most trouble I ever, ever got in for a joke that I wrote for Joan Rivers was a couple years ago. You know, her the reality show, Joan and Melissa, Joan Knows Best, was really all about her staying at Melissa's house, and she hated Melissa's guest room. It was down in the basement. It was, for Joan, it was very small and not fancy, and she was always making fun of it. Now, you guys, this is like a year and a half after that horrible Ariel Castro had held those girls hostage in Cleveland for like 10 years. It was a terrible, terrible case. He was a terrible man. The girls got out and were okay. He went to jail. He actually hanged himself in prison. He was dead now, right? So this is a long time after that. Joan goes on the Today Show to promote season four of the reality show, and uh, she does what, what I thought was a very benign little joke. She says to Al Roker, uh, yeah, back in Melissa's guest room, I gotta tell you, Al, those poor girls held captive in Cleveland had more walk-around space. <laughs> well, Al Roker almost shit his pants again that day. Uh, it was much too edgy for 8.35 in the morning. The internet got all upset. The three victims were furious. They held a press conference demanding an apology. I get an angry phone call from Melissa Rivers. And when I, Melissa calls you before 9 a.m., it's not gonna be good, right? And so, so she's like, God damn it, Tony, what did you write for my mom? She, she She's doing jokes about Ariel Castro. No jokes about Ariel Castro. No matter what she says, do not give her any more jokes about Ariel Castro. So does anybody here want to guess what the next phone call I got was? So it's Joan Rivers saying, Tony, I need jokes about Ariel Castro. Everybody's pissed and it's wonderful. So I gave her a couple of more jokes. She called TMZ and said, I'm getting on a plane from New York to LA. Meet me at LAX, I'll have great stuff for you. So she gets off the plane in summertime, LAX, full, full mink coat, and TMZ says, Joan, what do you what do you have to say to the, the Cleveland kidnapping victims that are so angry with you and demanding an apology? And she looks right at the camera and says, I don't know what they're so upset about. They got to live rent-free almost a decade. <laughs> For COVID, so she could deliver a line like this and then just flip it and exit. She looks at the camera and says, I mean, Jesus, I would love for a man to be that crazy about me. <laughs> <laughs> We're still lucky to have Tony Tripoli in town. So. I know. I know. I'm so happy that he's back. Me too. I think he was born wow. here. He was. Yeah. He actually went to high school because actually I, I can include a story about him later on. I don't want to give away an answer. Okay. So, all right. So, which internationally famous Bisbee comic wrote Digging Up My Mother? A love story. Doug Stanhope. The comics comic dish, uh, of all comics comics. And he's got good fashion sense. I like how he's got on multiple colors and plaid. That's right up your alley. Indeed. It really, it really is. You could do Doug Stanhope as a Halloween costume. Oh, that well, that's my everyday wear. And vice, <laughs> and vice versa. 
<laughs> right. Exactly. You know, he's got a lovely compound in Bisbee, Arizona. I uh, I was lucky enough to be asked to go on um, a a short run of shows with some comics. Me, Amy Blackwell, Charlie Spees, and Anthony Decimito. We all uh, went down south and Stanhope showed up to one of our shows, him and Bingo and a couple of friends of theirs and watched the show and had a good time. And we all got to hang out afterwards. And Anthony and Amy and Charlie went to talk um, on Doug's podcast with them. It was very exciting. Very cool. All right. Question five. What comedian was an Arizona State Teachers College alum and co-creator of The Tonight Show and its very first host, Steve Allen? I was, uh, I was, I don't, I was surprised to find that was a thing. And the more I dug up, the more it was like he had, he, he quit. He was going in 1940 something, he was going to Arizona State Teachers College which later became ASU, of course. Uh, but he was going out and he went to a sophomore year, quit and walked out and was like, F this. And then he went and got a job working, uh, a DJ job with a KOI radio, KOI, and did that for a couple of years and then moved to LA and then got his friends together and helped co-create the Tonight Show. But that guy was a, 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 a font of inspiration, a, a humanist, um, very much into science, uh, very much a skeptic about everything. And the, the more I, I read about it, I was, I was really impressed with Steve Allen. I just, I thought he was just some sausage king asshole, but no, he's really had a lot to say. And, and I really liked the idea that he was very much into science and, and, and I, I couldn't find it, but I swear to God, Marshall, uh, last year sometime I was just looking up stuff and, he got, I thought he got kicked off the Tonight Show because he said something inappropriate. Because he would do jokes, he would do his monologue with the piano, not in like uh, one of our other and, and revolutionary uh, of sex yeah. female, but he would, he would do that. So now I have a theory like that, okay, so he was hanging out in Phoenix in like 1942 ish, and just like not that long later, our girl showed up and, uh, but she, I can't imagine that, you know, a small town like Phoenix, you don't just not run into someone like Steve Allen, some struggling guy who doesn't know what he wants to do, right? He just quit ASU for his degree. He's like out of here. And then now he's like working for a radio station. Quick wit, you know, I, I just love, I just love the whole like, uh, human, how humans do that, how, how it's all like, uh, well, you know what? It's like the scientists have found the uh, invention of the wheel on different sides of the earth. You know, it wasn't just one person who invented right. the wheel. It was like it cropped up. It's the collective consciousness. And that's, right. that's exactly human. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so Phoenix, Phoenix with a hotbed. Yeah. You know? All right. So which comedy club is part of the national franchise found by Bud Friedman? Tempe Improv. So who was Bud Friedman? Bud Friedman grew up in New York City, as far as I can tell. Uh, he, um, what, was, what did I write? He, he was raised by uh, marauding Irish Catholics on his mother's side. His parents were vaudeville. No, is that who I'm thinking of? Yes, his parents. Who was the guy that was, oh, now I feel like, I don't want to. I don't want to give the wrong information, but Bud Friedman. Anyway, Bud Friedman started uh, the improv in Hell's Kitchen, and so fast forward so many decades, uh, they had he had thirty five international, uh, but now it's tapered back to twenty five national. They had one in a uh, uh, UK somewhere, I believe, uh, an improv. Oh. But, wow. I, I think it's funny that he started in Hell's Kitchen and then eventually moved his way into Arizona where 
old Sparky. It's like right next to old Sparky in a town that's regularly 122 degrees. Right, exactly. De lots of devil. So it's a nice callback. It's a nice callback to that. And who was the guy? You know what? I know I've got it in my notes for you there somewhere. Um, the uh, gentleman who I feel like there was someone whose mother was in vaudeville and i'm am i thinking of steve allen god there were so many questions i'm so <laughs> sorry <Gosh. laughs> all these things i wrote down i don't know how you do it i forget you know what i'm stupid i'll have to look at my notes that are that what i sent you ah here we go there she is Indeed, Sandra Bernhardt was the Saguaro High School alum and on Roseanne and on David Letterman 28 times. Do we have that video of Genevieve Bryce? I made her I made her say that question. I don't know if you have that. I don't. I'm sorry that didn't work out, Genevieve. It was on QuickTime and I was just too dumb to figure it out. But it was Genevieve reading the question and then she was very cute. She was like, Sandra Bernhardt. Aww. So Genevieve, if you're watching. Anyway, Genevieve was the founder and creator of Bird City. Again, to reiterate. <laughs> That's right, and there's a swag bag full of all kinds of good stuff. And then we've got, yes, and so Sandra Bernhardt. Yeah, David Letterman, 28 times. Now, what I read about her is she was graduated uh, in 73 from Arizona, somewhere in Arizona, and uh, 10 short grinding years later, First, uh, first uh, uh, set on Letterman. So ah. since eighty three, and then since eighty three, she was on Letterman. And that's when I graduated high school. God, I, I just you know I read stuff like that, and I think ah, I wasted my entire life. Well, see, I remember seeing her in the early nineties at Indiana University. What What was that? What were you seeing her at Indiana? Um, University? Um, she was doing she was doing a comedy show. It was basically her concert. Right. And it was all about her. I mean, and it was so funny. In fact, it was great because at the very end of it, she was like, you know, if anyone actually illegally recorded this, please let me know because I would love to get a copy of this. So. But sadly, I don't think anyone had. She's a she's pretty amazing. I like uh, I like her. Yeah, no, I mean, she's she is quite she's quite the comedian and has written lots of books. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So question eight, Arizona Bay is a comedy album referenced what uh, iconic comedian's hatred of LA, Bill Hicks. You're, do you know who he is? Do you remember him? I, I don't. Uh, super obscure, but had a lot, uh, the most influential of just about any comic. And the real shame is that it seems like people that die so young they like, for instance, Bill, Bobby Darren, I think is one of those two, uh, just had this fire underneath them. He was going, he was sneaking out of his house as a teenager and going into, uh, what's the, what's the big town? Of, it was it Minneapolis, I believe. Oh, I, no, I'm sorry. Minneapolis. That's Minnesota. Sorry. Uh, he was sneaking out of his house, driving to the big city and, uh, doing comedy at like 14 or something like that. And eventually his parents were like, why are you sneaking out of the house? And he was like, well, I'm doing comedy. And they were like, you don't got to sneak out of the house. <laughs> we, you know, right. let us know. it was just, and there's really just one documentary on Bill Hicks that you need to watch. And it's called American Me. And it's the one that is his family. The only one his family really supported. It's a gorgeous documentary. I highly suggest it. So what was Arizona Bay about? Arizona Bay was his comedy album where uh, Bill liked to profess that anybody in marketing should immediately kill themselves because they're just lying to the rest of America. Uh, but the um, Arizona Bay, so he hated LA so much. Um, he compared uh, the gold on the, you know, the, the gold in California to what uh, uh, hypodermic needles and fetuses on the ground. There's no, there's no golden cat path in California. It's all hypodermic needles and baby fetuses. But here's a quote. Um, oh, it's gone. All the shitty shows are gone. All the idiots screaming and the fucking wind are dead. I love it. Leaving nothing but a cool, beautiful serenity 
called Arizona Bay. That's right. When L.A. falls in the fucking ocean and it's flushed away, all that it will leave is Arizona Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Aw, Arizona Bay. Well, that sounds lovely. It does. That's it. I, would love. I guess. Oh, here we go. Here we go. All right. So what sarcastic comedian landed a writing gig on SNL? And then also multiple movies and TV shows. David, of Arizona. Indeed, David Spade. Yep. He had a, he actually has a great he has a late night show that uh was ca or canceled or he didn't do it for very long. Anyway, it was very funny. And he really he was bringing up some unknown comics. He'd be like, I saw this comic at a show and, and I just want to give her like five minutes. Laura bites. She was great, you know, and I follow her on Facebook and and shit and she's funny but it's just always so great when you see like someone you know or like a, a friend of yours and it's like i mean nobody's making it but it, to see your friend on television that's awesome and they're doing their jokes that they wrote that they love oh so good go on what else what else do we have all right so our next question what greenway high school alum was a favorite on tim and willie for doing multiple characters, a semi-finalist on Last Comic Standing, and cast on Walking Dead. Josh McDermott. Did you uh did did you know that one? No, because I, I did I haven't watched Walking Dead. <laughs> I haven't I haven't either. But uh this is a name that floats around a lot of um or you know, more or less, you know, shows with old school comics on it. Like, uh, you know, oh, Josh McDermott made it. He made it. He fucking, he did comedy and he was on Last Comic Standing. And now he's an actor. And it's like, he made it. And yeah, yeah, he did make it. But, you know, he's gone through some shit. He had, there was a problem. Like somebody, they were hassling him on social. He had to get rid of all of his social media because of some bullying, because of, something his character did or something. Oh. <laughs> but you know what? He came up through Phoenix and that's really kind of cool. Yeah. I had no idea. That's an Arizona guy there. Yeah. I'm going to have to track him down because I'm sure there must be clips of him on Tim and Willie. There's got to be right. Doing yeah. his voices. Right. So, yeah. So that'll be kind of fun to track down and. So it was funny. So actually for the multiple choice, the answers, I actually looked at the walking dead cast. And so they were all walking dead cast just because I had no, I was like, who should I put as the answers? I'm like, okay, <laughs> we're just going to use walking dead people. Is that what it was? Nice. All right. You know, I think and, and then what Phoenix comic is billed as the birth mother of the sexual revolution by the library of Congress. Rusty Warren. So, so, okay. So when, when you had Tony Tripoli in your backyard. Yes. Um, I immediately yeah. ran up to him and I said, Oh, do you, did you ever see Rusty Warren? And he was like, you know, he did something in high school and she was there and he just kept going on and on about Joan Rivers. <laughs> And then years later, learned who Rusty Warren was. Oh, boy. And the fact that she predates Joan Rivers. And okay. with, without Rusty, you wouldn't have a lot of these other comedians. I mean, she was considered so body, her stuff could never play on the radio. I believe it. So I believe the it. That, the fact that it had so many albums was kind of incredible. Well, her first album... Something for Sinners. Song for Sinners. We recorded live Sinners. at the Pomp Room in Phoenix, Arizona. Recorded 16th Street in Camelback. Yeah. Which was fascinating. Fascinating. So here's this lady singing her body songs, which, you know what? Honestly, they all of her stuff seemed more like, uh, yeah, it was body. But also, uh, at the end of it, she was, actually her underlying message was one of compassion. So right. it was just, she just had the biggest heart and she just, it seemed like she just wanted to make people laugh, but also she was playing the piano. So my theory is that somehow 
Steve Allen saw her playing the piano. Uh, well, you know, so piano bars used to be a thing. So the pomp room was a piano bar where there actually was a shelf on the baby grand. And so that you would have sat your drinks on that shelf. It was that tiny. And so she would be sitting there tickling the ivories and be like, oh, I see you here again. Oh, and you didn't bring your wife again. Right. So right. I mean, she was doing all, all these little ditties. And so, yeah, I mean, that was back when almost everybody had live music. In some ways, I think we were going back to that just before COVID where everybody started having live music. It really seemed like it. And, but also here's a fun fact about Rusty Warren lived out her, lived out her later years with her life partner, Sarah in Hawaii. Well, it was like, so she was renting in downtown Phoenix mm -hmm. when knockers up came out it was such a huge hit for her that she then had a house built in paradise valley that said the house that knockers built and so even though she's no longer there the it still says that that's amazing i want that house so so yeah i mean and so she is still around she is 89 i uh, i love it this what well, this bitch is gay. She's the bitch is a fucking lesbian, which is awesome. And she was running the town in the fifties. And also entertainer of the year in Las Vegas. I think five years in a row. Fuck. That's just, I, I just, eh, I love that when people, when they hide their sexuality in like right in front of you and people, you know, they were like, Oh, that rusty woman, <laughs> boy, she's going to cause any man a problem or whatever, you know, they said, but she was digging it with the chicks. I just, you know, but then she's singing these songs about don't give up on love or, you know, or what was it like? Um, Oh, the man, <laughs> the lady is like, he, he, he asks you to marry him and then he lets you have his kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, well, and that was, I think it's like, and so much of her humor was very women centric. I mean, when she, when she would travel around, it was like all these wives would come to see Rusty and they would drag their husbands who drank. So right. she would always welcome back in those bars because she packed the house. Right. And she was funny. Right. I listened to so many. It was, I listened to a bunch of her stuff, whatever I could find online. I listened to. Well, and it's so funny because she'll talk about how it's like she finds new audiences because as kids start going through their, their parents record collection after they've passed, it's like rusty albums would have been way in the back. So that way you would never see them. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, and so, yeah, I mean, even in, at the age of 89, she is still keeping everyone in stitches. She's a hoot. Now, Roseanne lives in Hawaii, too. I wonder if they ever, like, run into each other or I feel like well, Roseanne... she's, actually in she's actually in California now. Oh, she is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, I do want to, I do want to, I do want to show some bits it's like marty talks about how she's loving this segment and that she wants to know how she can get in line for the swag bag did did she answer and, and then carol lee got nine out of eleven wow okay wow that's pretty yeah. good that's pretty darn good carol lee i wonder which two she missed and the more i think about it the more i i think it is steve allen whose mom was in vaudeville and then his dad her his parents were in vaudeville and his dad died when he was like a little under two years old and his mom was like i gotta make a living and left him with her irish catholic family and um according to my research milton burrell said that his mother was the funniest woman he knew the funniest woman in vaudeville, which is high praise for Milton Berle. Yeah. It makes me think that she did not sleep with him because that's really the only way to get that kind of praise from a man. Well, and so Steve Allen, when he had his show in LA, hosted Hubcap and the Wheels on his show. Shush. 
Right. Yeah. So again, that Phoenix connection, that three degrees of separation, because everybody knows everybody. Right. And that's like what Phoenix is kind of. Oh, very, very much so. Yeah, no, I mean, that's one of the things I love about Phoenix is it's like, I mean, just the other day, I was actually on a virtual chat with Arizona Theater Company and their new assistant artistic director. And all of a sudden, it's like we started talking. It's like, well, wait a minute. We have the same circle of friends. We must have always just been like passing each other. It's like as one of us is going into the party, one of us is leaving. Right. So it was just so funny. So. Oopsie. And, and Carol Lee missed nine out of 11. Or say she missed nine and 11. Um, okay. Okay. Oh, nine and 11. I don't know how you want to work that. If whoever you think wins, send me their address and I'll just send them what. Uh, okay. So then I guess, did anyone do better than Carol Lee? I don't know how they could. I know. That's pretty amazing. I mean, you usually people on our trivia usually get like, I got three out of four. I'm surprised anyone's listening at all. <laughs> but I mean, that would be your friends, not mine. <laughs> well, friends maybe they were, they were my friends. No <laughs> longer. <laughs> my friends are comics. They're too busy. They're all in a show. They've already seen me get drunk and talk to a bearded guy. <laughs> I mean, my beard. I'm sorry. That's what I meant. My beard. Aw, so that's very sweet that Carol Lee says that Marty can have the swag bag. So okay. Marty, if you um, send me um, via email or on Facebook, if you send me your address, because we don't want everybody who's watching to send you random stuff. Right. And then do you, um, Carol Lee, do you want the hat? Would, would you wear a baseball cap? It's I so guess it's, actually, I guess it's a, it's a trucker cap. I've had, I had, I was tested for COVID. I'm negative, but look at this fucking hat. I'm going to send Jill $25 so I can get my own. It's so cute. JK Jill Kimmel. That's what it says. And she signed it anyway. Very cool. Okay. So I will make, I will get Marty's address and send that off to you. Oh my God. I love it. I didn't. Okay. So yeah, that's very exciting. Woohoo. <laughs> All right. Well, Leslie, thank you so much for being on and talking about comedy history here in Arizona, because I bet most people don't even realize that we have such a depth of comedy. Did you uh, now I had a couple of jokes in the front of like the slides that I sent you. What was it about 1881? The Euro. I'm okay. You're okay. Corral. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know where to fit it in, so I cut it. Oh, you're so sweet. Uh, what did one sex worker say to the other? I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist. No, really? <laughs> I'm so shocked. Hey, you're a feminist, too. Well, that, that, that's why I was so happy to be like, we can talk about Rusty Warren. Any day we talk about Rusty Warren is a good day. I can't. So I always talk about how we need a bust of Rusty Warren here in the city of Phoenix. We need to start that. I'm I, totally mean, I, that. I, However, I would love to have a rust of Rusty Warren somewhere. However, I can help you. Please come to me first or whatever group you gather to make that happen. I think that would be incredible. What would it be? Would it be Rusty like going like this or would it be Rusty at a piano? Oh. I think I have to be here at a piano or just standing there. It could even be like maybe one of her record albums. Kind of that. Amazing. With that, with that, with that big, I mean, if it was done a copper, so that way the hair would be nice and big and red. Because, <laughs> you know, secret, that wasn't her natural hair color. I'm sure you're shocked to find out. Just like I, I, I don't think that's your natural hair color. I don't. <laughs> Wait, I was born with this. <laughs> and the carpet matches the drape. My eyelashes are pink. Aw. Is, is that because the dye ran down? My mother was a natural magenta head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just excited people listen and we, we got to give away these. Bags. I'm so excited. I'm going to tell Jill. She'll be like, great. 
I love being new to comedy. It's so weird. It's like, I'm so old, but yet it's also like, I'm this weird neophyte doing comedy. So I was like, ah, oh, certainly nobody would ever be mean to me on purpose. <laughs> oh, yeah, they would. <laughs> so how do people watch your comedy show on Brill Street? How do, what's, is there a link they should go to? Do they track you on Facebook? Thank you for asking. It's literally live on Brill, B-R-I-L-L. Uh, just Google that, look it up on Facebook, and there'll be a, a sort of a, you know, everything's on that Facebook. It's like, you'll see the, pre the past shows, which are still up, I believe. So we record all that, and it stays on Facebook, I think. It, it does, which is great. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Unless I didn't you made your own Facebook page for the show, so that's really cool. Right. Yeah. I'm very excited. Yeah. Christopher has been a big help. It was nothing I probably would have done by myself, but you know, you get two people working on something and it's like, Oh yeah, let's do this fun thing. Right. No, it is fun. Yeah. What, uh, anyway, thank you so much. I had a great time. Um, I don't know what else to say. Oh, I would like to say one thing there. Uh, Gary Shandling, do you know who he is? I do. Uh, Gary Shandling actually moved to Arizona when he was a child because his brother was sick, his parents. And so his parents moved the whole family here. Oh, wow. Gary Shandling again, dropped out of his college. He was trying to be, he was going to be uh, an engineer and he had all these jokes he'd written. Uh, his brother would die. His mother was very overbearing, very protective of him. He uh, was in Tucson. He heard that George Carlin was coming up the improv to do his show and so gary shandling gathered up all his jokes drove two hours to phoenix cornered george carlin and said i want to write or do comedy or something will you look at my jokes george carlin said i don't even this was in like the 80s or the 90s george carlin said come back tomorrow gary shandling drove two hours home the next day drove two hours back George Carlin said, you know what? It's super rough, but you've got a lot of stuff. Yeah, you should probably go to L.A. Why not? Go to L.A. You've got a lot of stuff here. It's just like. And he may actually have read it. That's how it happens, right? You know, maybe he had nothing better to do. Or he saw that look in Gary Shandling's eyes. It was like, don't make me come back and not tell me. Who knows, you know? But Right, because, yeah, if I tell you to come back tomorrow, I know you will, and I don't want to do that to you two hours and if it weren't for that i mean you know maybe gary shaley still would have done everything he did but whatever. but you know a lot of it just takes that one person saying hey you know you should do that and that's what it is marshall that's how we I all mean, that's what it is for so much i mean i mean it's like i mean like doing this i mean i have so many folks who tell me this is the bright spot of their week because it's the one time where they can sit down and forget what's going on outside and just sit down and have fun. So, yeah. So, and thank you for researching your comedy history and bringing us some really cool stories. I hope so. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Will you, will I, you me out of here or do I have to do something? Yep. Nope. I, I, I will zip you out of there. So, oops, there you go. All right, so now it is time for Little Arizona and sticking with this theme of comedy. Well, so this segment is sponsored by First Families of Arizona. You can track them down on Facebook under First Families of Arizona or on their website, which is tffoa.org. And so the reason why we do Little Arizona is, as Leslie got me to talk about, I grew up in this little tiny town of like 25 people in Indiana a little farm town surrounded by cornfields and everything else. And so I kind of have this special place in my heart for small towns. And so tonight we're going to talk about nothing Arizona, just because I'm like, you know, what name can be more comedic than nothing Arizona? And so nothing Arizona is actually just south of Wikiup, because I'm sure that means a lot to folks or probably about a hundred miles outside of kind of, kind of North of Phoenix. And so it is now pretty much a ghost town. And, you know, and not all ghost towns are old. 
I mean, actually, nothing began in 1977. Supposedly, it got its name by some drunks who decided to name it nothing. Um, it lasted... So, I mean, it lasted for quite a while. It was abandoned in 2005. At its height, it had four people living in it. That's right. It was a booming metropolis. It had a gas station and a small convenience store. And then around 2005, it was abandoned. And then 2009, it was purchased by a gentleman who tried to do like a trailer park for RVs as well as do pizzas. Sadly, that didn't last very long, and it's now just kind of sitting there worse for the wear. It's interesting also in 2016, Century 21 did a whole um, real estate promotion on Give Dad Nothing, where you could get 24 hours of a lease of Nothing, Arizona. You could go there for 24 hours and it would be your town. It came also with a certification of nothing and of gift card, probably good for nothing. So, you know, actually I'm talking to my video guy, Chris, about maybe going up to nothing and doing a little bit there just because it's, it's nothing. So next week in honor of world AIDS day, which is December 1st, um, we are back on Thursday and we have as our guest Southwest center. So looking forward to that. I think that'll be really interesting. Now, remember, if you have any questions, comments, or stories, feel free, free to throw them in email, whatever. Don't forget, we have Haunted Phoenix tours coming up on December 12th. Also, be sure and check out my website um, where you'll find you could buy a Hip Historian Activity book, which is a knockoff of one of those menus you would get at like a Denny's with some crayons with fun activities and things to do. Um, you'll find those at the night market on Sunday and then also on Saturday at the holiday market where we'll all be wearing masks at both places. So those will be fun events. So again, this is only made possible because all of you are out there listening and enjoying yourselves. Now we do have sponsorship from AARP and they have a message in that looking for ways to stay active, healthy, and informed without leaving home, AARP Arizona has lots of online offerings and virtual get togethers. Find out all the ways you can click to connect with your community at aarp.org slash near you to find out about some of the cool programming that they have. Now the intro video, the first one we did actually, that was Tempe tourism. We did that several years ago. Um, then I always play my little intro video with my friend Cole, who wrote the music as well as Chris, who did the video. And I always want to give a huge shout out to PJ Vader Baron my cocktail advisor, because don't you all wish you had a cocktail advisor? Now, as we get ready to leave, I do have Mr. Ho, who is a Sunny Slope boy now living on the East Coast with his own orchestratica band, as well as there is a several found film footage clips from Arizona in the 50s. So everyone have a safe and amazing Thanksgiving, whatever you choose to do, and I'll see you next week. Oh, 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 oh,